there, my name is Maggie Benson and I'm a museum educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Today, you're in for a real treat. We're going on a special VIP tour of the Sant Ocean Hall with my colleague, Laura Norin, an ocean and climate education specialist. We're going to get up close and personal with some giants of the sea, like whales, squid, and sharks and explore the giant questions we have about these ocean giants. And later, we'll take you behind the scenes to our aqua room, which houses real, live jellies. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go. Hey, Laura, what are you doing? Hey, Maggie. Well, I am trying to measure this giant kelp here, but it is just so giant. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I think you're gonna need a ladder. I think so too. <laughs> so I heard you wanna learn about some of the giants we have in our Sant Ocean Hall at the Natural History Museum. That's right, Laura. I have some giant questions about some of the giants here, and I brought along my field notebook so I can record some of those observations. We can use our field notebook to think about some of the giant questions that you have, and then also some of the giant questions that scientists are asking about some of these specimens I'm gonna show you today. So where do we start? Well, let's start right here at our giant kelp. This giant kelp can get up to 175 feet tall. Wow. And it can grow up to almost two feet per day, Maggie. You might overlook this specimen when you first enter our ocean hall, but I really want you to understand how important it is. It's important because it is what we call an ecosystem engineer. That means that it maintains the balance of an entire ecosystem. Laura, are kelp like forests of the sea? Yeah, Maggie, so I bet you're kind of thinking that. It kind of looks like a bit of a tree, right? So this is an algae, and this kelp here is really important because it acts like the baseline of an ecosystem, like a tree would in a forest. All of these animals and plants that are living in a kelp forest are relying on this kelp for habitat, for food, and for shelter. Laura, what kind of animals are in kelp ecosystems? There are so many different animals. We have animals that live kind of at the base. We have sea urchins and sea stars and small fish. Lobsters? And lobsters, yes, exactly, and octopus as well. And then in the midsection of the kelp forest, we have a lot of sharks and maybe otters and seals. Who doesn't love a cute otter wrapped in a bunch of kelp? Aww. And at the top, at the canopy, we even have things like birds and, of course, more fish and things like orcas. Laura, I know what I want to record in my field notebook at this stop. I want to draw a kelp forest. Yes, I think that would be very kelpful. <laughs> So let's think about some of those animals that I talked about before, because all of those animals rely on the kelp. Lara, what kind of giant questions are scientists asking today to learn more about kelp forests and how to conserve them? Some scientists are asking, how are kelp going to respond as the ocean continues to warm? They want to really know at what degree these kelp forests are going to decline in, and also maybe what humans can do to help keep these kelp forests strong and healthy as the ocean warms. Lara, where to next? We've looked at the bottom of the food chain or the baseline of an entire ecosystem. Now I want to take you to the very top. I want to show you an apex predator. Cool, let's go. Maggie, behold, our apex predator. This is our megalodon model. Megalodon were up to 60 feet long. They weighed up to 50 tons, and they were about three times the size of great white sharks today. Laura, standing here in the shadow of this megalodon is kind of thrilling and a little bit scary, even though it's just a model. It's huge, right? Giant. So these megalodon sharks lived from about 23 million years ago to about 3.6 million years ago. So they're extinct. Yes. Shoo! Scientists are very sure that the megalodon is extinct. 3.6 million years ago, they abruptly left the fossil record and we do not see any megalodon teeth after 3.6 million years. So you can be confident on your next beach trip that you will not be encountering a megalodon shark. <laughs>
that jaw is huge. It is huge, giant. So this jaw produced a bite force of 40,000 pounds, which what does is that mean? the largest bite force in the animal kingdom. So that's the power at which it could just close its jaw. And that's about 10 times greater bite force than a great white shark today. There's a lot of teeth in that mouth. Yes. And I actually have one to show you right here, Maggie. So this is a megalodon tooth. And these teeth are very important for understanding the megalodon because this tooth is actually the only thing that fossilizes from sharks. Do you want to take a look? This tooth is huge. The teeth can be up to seven inches long. And for comparison, we have a mako tooth right here that you can take a look at that is much smaller. So mako shark is kind of a big shark today, but this is no comparison to the megalodon. Yep, definitely. And mako sharks are actually the closest living relatives of the megalodon. A lot of people think that it might be the great white shark, but actually it's the mako, which is why we have our megalodon model modeled after a mako shark. So is that something that scientists can determine from the teeth that are left behind? You said that's the only thing that fossilizes. So most of the fossils that we look at with megalodon are teeth, and that's because the rest of the shark is made out of cartilage. And cartilage you can find like in your ear right here. Mm -hmm. That cartilage is just not gonna show up in the fossil record like the teeth do. So most scientists really just rely on the teeth to answer these giant questions that we have about our megalodon sharks. What do megalodons eat? Scientists can look at fossilized bones of whales and actually see shards of megalodon teeth embedded in the bone. Or they can see scrapes on whale bones from megalodon teeth. So from that evidence, we know that megalodon would eat whales. And we also know that they would eat things like sea turtles and most likely probably other sharks as well. Laura, in my field notebook, I'm going to draw a megalodon tooth and I'm gonna record some ideas about what megalodon ate, like whales and turtles. I think that's a great idea because we know how important these fossilized teeth are to understanding megalodon. What other big questions do scientists have today about megalodon? Scientists are able to ask a lot of questions about the megalodon, like where did it live? How long was it in the fossil record for? What caused an extinction? What did it eat? What role did it play in an ecosystem? And then how did that ecosystem change when this animal went extinct? So Maggie, let's transition now from this ancient ocean predator of our past and learn about an iconic ocean representative that still swims in our ocean today. Maggie, I would like you to meet Phoenix. She's beautiful. Phoenix is a North Atlantic right whale, and they can be about 50 to 60 feet long, and they can weigh up to 70 tons. That's huge. Pretty giant. And you can find them on the east coast of the United States. They breed in Georgia and Florida area, and then they migrate all the way up to the Bay of Fundy, which is in Canada. Phoenix is our Ocean Hall ambassador. She is overlooking the entire space. We use her to talk about conservation and ocean preservation, and also how groups of animals can be impacted by humans. Phoenix is named Phoenix because she was entangled at one point in fishing line. And when a whale gets entangled in fishing line, that's very dangerous. But she was able to free herself from that fishing line and produced children and grandchildren. Like a phoenix, she rose from the ashes and lived a very long and healthy and happy life. Why do they call them right whales? The term right whale was coined because they were the right whale for whalers to hunt. One reason is when they are shot, they actually float. So it was really easy for these whalers to be able to bring these whales onto their boat. And then also because they really like to hang out at the surface of the ocean. They don't dive very deep and they're pretty docile. They were a crowd favorite of the whalers and so much so that in the 1930s, there were only about 100 North Atlantic right whale left. Now we have about 300 to 400 in our ocean. 
scientists are able to track each individual North Atlantic right whale through photographs. They actually are able to identify each specific individual right whale through something called callosities. And those are those bumps that you can see on Phoenix's face right there. These callosities are unique to each individual whale. It's kind of like freckles on your face. It's not gonna look the same. No two are alike. How much food do whales have to eat a day to get so big? Phoenix is gonna eat about 26,000 pounds a day wow. to maintain this giant size. And they do that through a very special process. They use baleen. You wanna take a look, Maggie? Yes, absolutely. So this probably looks very different than the teeth that you are familiar with in your own mouth. Uh, this looks more like my hair than my teeth. Yeah, that is a really great observation. So this is keratin, and it is the exact same thing that our hair is made out of. And so how does this work? How do whales eat with this? So these baleen plates, they will hang down from Phoenix's mouth. They will catch a bunch of these tiny copepod and krill in these hairs. They get stuck. From there, what they do is they take their tongue and they lick the baleen sheets and then they swallow all of that krill. 26 thousand pounds of krill and copepods a day. They must be feeding all day and all night. Basically, yeah, they are filter feeders. So they will go around in the ocean kind of passively feeding pretty much all the time. And Maggie, I have something else to show you. Okay. Do you have any guess to what this is? It looks like a bone of some sort, but it's not really the color. What if I told you that was whale earwax? Um, what? Yeah, so that is a model. So it's a 3D print of whale earwax. What kind of things are scientists learning by studying whale's earwax? Well, it's not like our earwax, Maggie. So it builds up over time. This whale is going to have this earwax in its ear for its entire life. And whales, they can live a really long time, 50, 60, 70 years. So this earwax is collecting a bunch of information from the ocean, and it's allowing scientists to understand the environment that a whale lives in, and also how that whale is responding to the environment. So it's kind of like a composite, like a map and a weather station all at once. There's a couple things I want to record in my field notebook. Fishing entanglements are a problem for North Atlantic right whales. And North Atlantic right whales eat 26,000 pounds of copepod and krill in a day. Up next, Maggie, we're going to journey deep into the ocean where it's cold and it's dark. And we have another ocean giant just waiting to meet us. Exciting. Let's dive in. So Maggie, welcome to our giant squid. This squid is huge. How big can giant squid get and how much can they weigh? Giant squid can get about 40 feet long and they can weigh nearly a ton. How deep in the ocean do giant squid live? They can live between 1,500 feet and 3,000 feet. Wow. In total darkness. It's dark, it's cold. This is one of two that we have here at the museum. This is a male right here. And then around the corner, we have our female giant squid, which is even bigger. That one is about 24 feet long. This giant squid was caught by fishermen off the coast of Spain. And the government of Spain was able to give the Smithsonian on a loan this giant squid for us to use for education purposes. And now it lives here. It looks like this squid has some big eyes. Yeah, and you know what, Maggie? I have a special treat for you. I want to show you a model of this giant squid eye that we show to visitors at the museum all the time. Let me see this. It looks like it is definitely <laughs> bigger than my head. I would have to agree with that. It's about the size of a dinner plate, and it is the largest eye in the animal kingdom. And it is one of also the most advanced eyes of any invertebrate. It's very good at seeing. Why does it have such huge eyes? Yeah, that is a great question. One of those giant questions that we can think about here. Scientists might think that it's so it can see prey. Remember, it's really deep and dark in the ocean, so there is not light there. So maybe they're using this giant eye to see bioluminescent animals, get away from predators. Lara, these squid are cloaked in mystery and folklore. Yes. 
These squid have fascinated people for thousands of years. If you've heard of 20,000 leagues under the sea, or if you've heard of the Kraken before, both of those are lore and legend about giant squid. And as scientists have learned more about what actually a giant squid is, we've been able to dismiss some of those folklore, even though they are still really fun to think about culturally. So the science is helping us to fill in where our imagination took the place. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And people have been fascinated with this from a scientific perspective for a really long time too. The first specimen that was collected was in 1874 and the person that collected it ended up putting it in its bathtub. <laughs> Well, where else are you going to put a giant squid? There's a lot of tentacles to keep a hold of. So what have scientists learned since 1874 about the giant squid? And what kind of questions and tools do they have to answer those questions? As technology has improved, so has our understanding of the giant squid. We have these amazing things called ROVs, remote operated underwater vehicles, and AUVs, automated underwater vehicles. So these are like robots in yes. the ocean, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah, it's basically like just sending a camera down thousands and thousands of feet and hoping a giant squid will show up. Does and that happen? It has, it has happened a couple of times. And did you know that the first live giant squid was caught on camera in 2004, not that long ago? Laura, for my field notebook, I want to record some ideas for how to catch these on camera again in the future. Laura, thanks so much for giving me this awesome tour of the Sand Ocean Hall and some of the giants that call it home. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And Maggie, before you go, you have one more stop on this tour. Behind the scenes in the aqua room with Dr. Alan Collins. He's going to tell you a little bit more about another invertebrate that we have in our ocean. Alan, thank you so much for having us. I've never been in this space before. Can you tell me where we are? Absolutely. We are in the aqua room, which is a facility where we keep live animals. We've been looking at some giant specimens in the ocean hall, and now we're looking at some smaller ones. Yeah, they may be small, but they make giant populations, and those giant populations have a really big impact on our ocean and on planet Earth. How big are those populations? So that's one of the things that uh, jellies are really good at, is making big populations through their life cycle. Many jellies can be present in very large numbers for a particular period of time. And clone themselves. They clone themselves all over the place and they just wait for conditions to be good. When they all bloom like that, they create these massive populations and those are really important in the marine ecosystem for a lot of different reasons. Well, let's just pause for a moment and take a look at these jellies because they are so cool. I feel like I can watch this tank forever. It's really mesmerizing, right, to watch them floating around in there because they, they're constantly in movement and it's sort of a, you know, there's a pattern to it, but it's also a bit chaotic. It's a lot like watching flames, like a fireplace. Alan, what's it like when you get stung by a jellyfish? Well, it depends on the jellyfish. Pretty much every time you go in the ocean, you're getting stung by jellyfish. So you've been in the ocean, yeah? Oh yeah, yeah and so I've been stung. Yeah, so <laughs> you were stung and noticed. You were probably also stung and, and not noticing. So lots of jellies are small and they have very small stinging capsules. And so when they sting you, you can't feel it. Or maybe, maybe where you're a little have thin skin or you're sensitive around your lips, you might feel a little tingling or itching. And then that goes all the way up to a little tentacle gets on you, you notice it right away, it hurts, and uh, will create red marks and stuff like that, to a real problem. So there's a few jellyfish that can make people sick and even kill them in five minutes or so. The majority of the jellyfish are not bad stingers, but that's an association that a lot of people have with them that's sort of negative. But then on the flip side, people are often really excited about them and they love to watch them in an aquaria. And uh, so it's, it's kind of neat that way. Alan, thank you so much for showing us behind the scenes in the aqua room today and introducing us to your jellies. Totally my pleasure. I'm so glad we got to explore the Sand Ocean Hall together today. We got to see some giant specimens, and Laura helped us think about the even bigger questions scientists can ask by studying them. We also met Dr. Alan Collins, who taught us that tiny jellies can be giants too. 
We hope you enjoyed this very special tour of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Thank you.